All right, uh, so we're going to start. Uh, it's really a great honor and pleasure to have Dr. K, uh, Yvonne uh, Kegel uh, with us today. And uh, I'm Fawaz Habal. I'm the Executive Dean of the School of Engineering Applied Sciences. This activity here is under the auspices of our joint degree with the Graduate School of Design. Some of you know about it. It's called the Master Degree in uh, design engineering, and uh, it's very different from any degree at Harvard. It's a collaborative degree, and collaborative degree means both professors from two different schools come together to the class and work together and teach together, which is really uh, kind of very interesting experience. I teach myself there and quite a, useful in many different ways. The school, this degree was built ground up by faculty from both schools. We believe this is the best way of trying to educate a cohort of students to learn how to problem solve. And they come up with all kinds of solutions for all kinds of open-ended problems, including things related, for instance, this year. Last year, we did food, food as a system, as a business, as a waste, as a nutrition, as many things. This year, we're looking at problems like related to uh, technologies for the elderly, including things like loneliness, aside from other medical problems. So we, we think this is a great degree, and it's unique in its, its scope. And it's unique also in its own students. The students come from a different cohort of uh, people who come from different areas, uh, uh, including engineering, business, technologies, uh, uh, architecture, and many others. So. Uh, we're really fortunate to have Dr. Yvonne Kegel today with us. Uh, our speaker today combined two impressive careers. Most of us consider a career in medicine as wonderful endeavor. A career in, as astron an as, uh, astronaut would be amazing. You would agree to that. But combining both is really kind of uh, unbelievable. So it looks like Dr. K Kegel's interest in medicine started at an early age. Apparently, and it's not surprising, her father was in medicine and her mother was in the Air Force, so you could see where the two tendencies, I guess, came. But apparently, as a young uh, girl, she would sneak into her father's medical library, spend hours looking at what? X-ray images. Now, she found these black and white X-ray images very inspiring, I guess, and she liked them. And she said, they intrigued me, so kind of interesting. Her first degree was in biochemistry. Uh, uh, she obtained it at San Francisco State. And then she moved to University of Washington for the medical school where she received her medical degree. However, the medical school, as we all know, is expensive. So she obtained a fellowship from the Air Force, a scholarship from Air Force, where she spent, later she had to spend several years in the Air Force, and that really facilitated something else later she get interested in. At uh, Brooks Air Force Base in Texas, this is where she became certified flight surgeon and enrolled in many aero medicine programs. And she served as the medical liaison for the Air Force and NASA for several years. She was working at the Kesley Siebold Clinic at the NASA uh, Johnson Space Center where she was an occupational medicine physician when NASA officials asked her, what would it take for her to leave her beloved job and do something outside that? And she said, a strawberry Sunday or go to, into space? <laughs> the answer was, we cannot do anything about the Sunday, but we can do something about the other. So that's how she entered the area of uh, as uh, being an astronaut, she flew several different sort of planes. She served in the Air Force. She went to the Gulf uh, War with the Air Force. And uh, finally, she applied for a precious slot as an astronaut, and she got it. So uh, Dr. Kegel has a very impressive career in the, uh, in the Air Force. And uh, she obtained many awards. I can cite all of them. It takes me a while, and you are not here to listen to me. So she get outstanding young uh, Amer uh, woman of America award. She get uh, the National Defense Service Award medal. 
She has the medal from the Air Force for achievements and uh, several honorary degrees from different universities. And she has been really an amazing participant in society and a service for the country. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kegel. Wow, good evening. <clears throat> I tell you, this day has been a long time in coming, and this evening seemed like it would never arrive, but it has. I'm here, we're here, and the fun is just starting. I thank you so much for your gracious time and your attention, and I'm really looking forward to engaging in this conversation. I specifically asked for design engineering because I wanted an integrated, interdisciplinary collaborative effort. And so I feel very honored, very privileged to be here and would like to share and engage some of my perspectives and experiences, but more than anything else, become your friend. So with that, <clears throat> let's get started. Talking about collaborative ideas and design, you know, 50 years ago, they said it was impossible to walk on the moon. Yet a dedicated academy of precision professionals came together and they were actually able to, by way of <clears throat> space vision and space technology, launch us in less than 10 minutes into space, in less than 90 minutes from liftoff, around the Earth in orbit, and in less than three days land us on the moon, all by way of working together and believing in the impossible. They said it couldn't be done. And today, we continue to pursue by way of things like the space shuttle and 17,500 miles per hour coming off of seven and a half million pounds of thrust, where there's so much energy that it could ignite the fireworks in every Olympic city that is hosting the Olympic Games. All of this is under your seat, where the sheer force of the vibration is so great that you never actually see your first launch, your eyes are closed so tight that the only thing you can remember is what you experience. You experience that first launch. This is what it's like to not only dream, but to train and aspire for something even greater than what's possible. You're launched, and best of all, it's been eight minutes and 30 seconds, and as you unbuckle your seatbelt, you're 250 miles above the Earth, going 17,500 miles per hour on your way to Mach 25, and as you step out of your seat, you're floating. The first word out of your mouth is, whoa. Guess what the second word? Whoa. <laughs> this is what it's like. Or as Story Musgrave, one of my favorite astronauts said, it's like skating on glass. So how does one get to float in less than 10 minutes 250 miles above the Earth with a view on science, technology, engineering, art, math, STEAM, a view on STEAM, or as I like to say, teams, much more collaborative, technology, engineering, art, math, and science, through the lens of weightlessness. Well, for me, it was all about trying to make sure I moved at Mach 25. My tricycle wasn't fast enough. There wasn't a spaceship that quite could get me as far as I wanted to go, and I wanted to take it a step beyond. 
It all started at the top of an old oak tree, July 1969, one hot summer night. When I was trying to break the record for hind and go seek, everybody was looking east and west, but really nobody was thinking to look north. And that's where I was hiding. Three hours into it, I hear a voice calling my name. Destiny had to be. The only reason I would come down and, and not make that record. And I heard that name call Yvonne, Yvonne, Yvonne. And surely I was ready to take that giant leap until I recognized that that voice was just my dad telling me to come down from the tree and come inside. I tell you, I told him it better be really good or else this was the last time I'd listened to him. And obviously it must have been pretty epic because I'm still listening to him today. So instead of taking that giant leap, which probably wasn't the smartest thing to do at the age of 10 or even worse, at the top of an old oak tree at any age, I came down, came inside, where he so silently pointed at this grainy image back then on an old TV, black and white, very grainy, rabbit-eared antennas. My job in the family of six kids was to sort of position the antenna for the entire Ed Sullivan show. And, but I wasn't being asked to do that. I was being asked just to look at the screen. And that grainy image, as I made it out, my dad said, that is human. That is man walking on the moon for the very first time. Immediately, I ran outside and looked at the moon because I had just been talking to the man on the moon, dancing with the stars. And I had to see this happening firsthand. And oh my gosh, guess what I saw? Nothing. So I ran right back out inside to make sure he was still on TV. And sure enough, he's still bouncing around walking on the moon. So I ran back outside to see if I could see him. And guess what I saw? Nothing. I did it again. And OK, folks, 10, 20, 25 stars. I never really saw anything. But after a while, I realized that what was more amazing than what human must look like walking on the moon is what I must look like to human. Granted, a silly 10-year-old girl running in and out trying to see a man on the moon. What I must look like from that view on the moon looking back on Earth. And at that moment, my dreams took wings. And I knew then that I, too, one day wanted to see my footprint on the moon. Fast forward, undergraduate biochemistry on to the University of Washington School of Medicine, where I earned my medical degree on an Air Force scholarship and spent the next 22 years yanking and banking in a wide variety of high-performance aircraft, from F-111s to F-15s, F-16s, F-18s, heavy helicopters, air-to-air -air refuelers, medevacs, you name it. Anything going to altitude, I wanted to be in it. 22 years later, rising to the rank of full colonel as a senior flight surgeon, it couldn't get any better than that, except for one thing. 15 years of it, uh, 15 years into it, I realized that I actually had intended to be an astronaut. Kind of was having a lot of fun, and it slipped my mind. It didn't actually slip my mind, but you know, at that time, it was a different world. And 15 years, I still wasn't able to put my dream at rest. So at that 15 year, we call it the career mark, I thought, Wow, you know, these jets, as amazing as they are, they don't seem to go quite fast enough, nor quite high enough. I knew then that the only way to go was up. And at that time, the only way to get there was the space shuttle. Ah, oh, the space shuttle. If I could put poetry to motion, I would call it the space shuttle with the space transportation system. Because in less than 10 minutes, it's placing you at Mach 25, and you're seeing the world go by literally floating the entire time. That's poetry in motion. So we've come a long way. We've come from placing the first human handprint on a cave in France 30,000 years upward ago, all the way to that first footprint on the moon. And yet, our journey has just begun. Because folks, we're going to Mars. We are scheduled for 2035, 
Go ahead and mark your calendars in case you don't have anything booked yet. But in order to be ready, we're going by way of, yes, we're going back to the moon, back to the moon in 2024, a mere six years from now we will be returning for the first time to do two cislunar missions, each one lasting 30 days. And that's to prepare us for that long journey to Mars, a journey that will take, in most cases, nine months, with a window that only comes around about every 18 months, but working on different propulsions that might reduce that time to six months. In the meantime, we want to test systems. We want to test system integrations, in particular the vehicle, satellites, communications, to make sure that they're going to be robust. So this time when we go back to the moon, we'll also be going to the dark side of the moon, meaning the side of the moon, the back side, where we haven't vetted communications yet. We want to make sure that we can reach back and talk to home from all trajectories and orientations. But we're not just looking at systems for robotics, vehicles, satellites, communication. We're also looking at the human system. Here we have Smithsonian Rex. We've been able to, in so many levels, replace or test or create simulations of the human body with robotic platforms. Eyes that have special ocular implants, ears that have the ability to hear, speech that can be synthesized, blood that can be circulated throughout the tissue in the lungs, synthetic lungs, heart, liver, spleen, and even limbs that are robotic and are able to grasp and rotate in 26 degrees of rotation for the, the wrists and the hands, just one degree short of the human body a spine that can support you, legs with shock absorbers. Now, many of the robotics right here in the Boston area are also evolving upon this. NASA has Valkyrie, a new robot, the first uh, woman robot, who I saw today and is really doing some amazing things. So we're getting the race one when it comes to robotics. But going into space and exploration isn't just about sending robotic capabilities, it's collaborative. But the human heart was born to explore. And the only way to know is to go. So to that end, we'll be looking at and testing and verifying the human system. Everything from the human genome. We just had twin studies sending a twin to space who came back showing that the genome had shifted, had altered, that the Gene expression of certain proteins changed after almost a year in space. That the twin is no longer technically a twin anymore. So we'll be looking at how the human genome changes with long duration and weightlessness and exposed to radiation and all the different things that we'll find when we're living and working and traveling through space. We'll be looking at many systems of the human body that include the heart, the lung, the bones, the muscle. But equally important is the mind, the behavior, the spirit, the soul. So we're looking at behavioral wellness and what neuroscientific, neurometric markers may be able to serve as early indications of behavioral drift, for better or for worse. But neurocognitive stressors, when you're in a remote, isolated environment have many analogs here on Earth, be it aging, military deployments, extreme adventures, submariners, Arctic and Antarctic, or we call them polar simulations or biohabitats, many correlations. But the major differences are in space, you're weightless. That's a cool stressor. <laughs> But it also takes three times as long to do things. And you can't just open a window or a door when you need to take a deep breath or get some fresh air. So we look at all of those things and how we can work to not only identify them, but mitigate or train or track them in a way that we can intervene so that we can maintain harmony throughout the crew, mission safety, and mission success. But not all stressors are bad. There's something called salutogenics, 
which is when you're in an extreme environment, that some stressors can actually foster independence, self-reliance, interdependency within a group that can build resiliency for the individual, the group, and group cohesiveness. So we're also looking at those sorts of changes as well. So it's important to know that when humans go, it's the whole body, the mind, the body, and the soul. But one of our biggest challenges is going to be finding ways to treat illness and injury. The NASA biocapsule is an inert vessel, um, or I should say capsule, that slips under the skin and can be placed in different portions of the body and can not only detect certain um, infections, illnesses, cancers, diabetes, but it can actually treat, be a delivery system for medication. But there are so many things that challenge the body. Early on, this is what we call the um, iron apron, which is a way of trying to push the body's blood back up into the torso and the head when it pulls in the legs. Um, it's trying to normalize things in space. So when you're in space, your blood volume actually floats towards your head and, to, and, and accumulates in your chest. So it's important to kind of balance that out to have a negative pressure system that can suck it back down. And that's what the iron apron does when you're in space. So that when you come back, you are able to continue to perform while you're upright without becoming lightheaded or passing out. We can train this on the ground before you uh, even go to space to induce that, that stress or that load to build your, build your tone or your resiliency. But the bigger challenge we actually have is muscle and bone. So as I said, in only eight minutes and 30 seconds, you're 250 miles above the Earth, going Mach 25, and you're floating. Doesn't get any better than that. But at only eight minutes and 31 seconds, you are already losing the space race, physiologically. Because the physiologic gradient, immediately upon weightlessness, shifts just like a wave does in the ocean. We're 70% water, and we get that same kind of wave transition or upheaval. So what happens? When you enter into space, it's the physiologic equivalent of having run six 40K marathons. And each time somebody tapping you on the shoulder and going, great race, but your finish line is a starting line, start all over again. So your body is really working. And over time, your muscles weaken, atrophy, your bones start to thin out or demineralize, and that creates difficulties when you're needing to move about, be it for your day-to-day -day living, put on a space suit, or do emergency procedures. Now that's the challenge we have on a good day. On a bad day, a simple sprain can really incapacitate you. Because after three months of weightlessness, even your growth hormone starts to diminish. And over time, you can lose up to 10% of your muscle mass and strength. When that happens, in six days, after your growth hormone starts to drop off, in only six days, you already start to weaken. And if you have an injury or a simple sprain, six days can be the difference between you being a visitor to Mars or being a colonizer because you're not able to climb back onto the spaceship. So it's very important that we find ways to rescue ourselves should we have illness or injury in space. So looking through the, the lens of Mars at what seems impossible, how are we not going to injure ourselves? Is there a solution on Earth that we can look to? Is there a solution in what we call Earth exploration. There are so many benefits that we've learned in going to space that we can bring back down to Earth because space is no longer just a destination. It is a journey. It's a demonstration platform for so many technologies and capabilities. But are there things here on Earth that can help us in space, in particular when our bodies become weak or injured? Well, yes, there is. It's called lift. 
what is LIFT? LIFT is taking weeks of therapy and reducing it to days, days of pain into minutes. LIFT is something that was developed and refined over 30 plus years and appears to be able to accelerate the restoration and resiliency of inflamed sprains and strains on the limbs that may be days or decades old, and in most cases, in just a matter of minutes. How does it work? Well, first of all, it took a lot of work to get there. 25 years of biochemistry and all told about 30 years of design engineering starting with trying to solve a problem and realizing that the solution lies in our own bodies. Our body already does this naturally. So how can we amplify or augment that? And that's what LIFT basically does. It regeneratively takes the energy from injury and uses it to mobilize and rebalance injured and inflamed tissue so that the injury is able to self-correct, correct itself. It's pretty remarkable. What does it look like? Well, ask me what 10 minutes looks like. Here we have a sprained knee, pretty evident. A lot of bleeding and swelling, no fracture or, or problem on the x-ray, but certainly a lot of pain, upwards of eight, nine, ten out of 10 uh, pain. Difficulty weight bearing, locking the knee, walking. This would normally take several weeks, six weeks, six to 10 weeks in order to correct. Here's your after picture. The bruise will take a little bit of time to go away, but the swelling is noticeably down, knee is locked, there's no pain, and they're running stairs. That's what 10 minutes looks like. It's not me, it's not man, it's not medicine, it's wearable you. Yes, a wearable solution for you. And it's innovative, it's transformative, and it's here, right here. Fits in a little case. Studies pending. But if you want to know more about it, please don't hesitate to see me afterwards. But you know, what I really want to spotlight is more than just the body's amazing capacity to heal itself. What I really want to talk about is the power possessed in the pursuit of the impossible. In a world that seems like it's gone awry, there are actually at least two things that we all still have control over. What we believe and what we dream. And if you put the two together, you can empower yourself to the point where even the impossible has potential. Because really, what is the impossible anyway? If you decode the word impossible, what do you get? I M possible. So in closing, what dream and what dream trajectory do you believe in enough that could possibly course correct this mothership we call Earth and conceivably change the course of time? How do you do it? Well, as an astronaut, I'd like to say it's not all that difficult because all you have to do is bring poetry in motion back down to Earth and then use it to relaunch your dream back to the moon, on to Mars, and push your potential, push your envelope somewhere far and beyond whatever lies just on the other side of the I am 
possible. Thank you, and Ad Astra. And while you're thinking of questions, um, uh, I'd like to share with you kind of that journey in, in developing innovation because when you're in something like design engineering, I envy you. I actually wish that instead of being up here, I was in the seat where each of you are. And for me, that journey started way back in high school physics. Um, and, and it continued through my Girl Scout years when I was learning all about adventure and traveling and hiking. Then at the University of Washington, I um, uh, was part of a program called um, WAMI, um, where you could train throughout the Washington, Alaska, Montana, and Idaho area. So I did trauma and rescue in um, the desert, Montana, Alaska. And we were always given some very sophisticated equipment, but it never failed. The air compressor didn't work. Uh, at altitude, there were no plugs in the desert, and pretty much all you had was the mass trousers to use as really the first wearable. So we would find ways to creatively wrap, load, and go. And even your boot was a lifesaver because you just didn't want to take that off. It really contained injury and swelling and inflammation quite a bit. So over the years, I carried that with me as a flight surgeon and going to rescue areas um, and accident scenes, I was able to continue to evolve that. Now, I love doing that, you know, as a Girl Scout in medical school um, and, uh, and in the Air Force. But I really wanted to take it, as I said, faster, higher, and more of a challenge, really touch the edge of the impossible. And so I thought, no better place than Mars. And when I decided that I wanted to really find a way to solve a problem, I went back into that dream of the impossible and all of the learning and experience that came up through the years. And I use that knowledge to really think about how you can have a self-rescue device that is not powered that is made up of parts of the spaceship itself or the packaging or the cargo material because that's all you've got to work with or your own suit and that it had to be something that was simple that you could do it even if you were really deconditioned but it had to be fast because you're losing muscle over a six day period of time. And when you put all of that together, it looks impossible but when you really think about how nature does it, how our bodies do it, um, and the whole concept of design engineering, it's doable and it's really transformative. So we've been really helping so many people in so many walks of lives. Um, and now we're ready to take it faster, higher, and see if we can do something to um, not just help the mission, but in learning how to help the mission, bring it back and help those in underdeveloped countries, disaster situations, any situation where someone needs rapid self-rescue but doesn't have access to the resources or um, the equipment to regain their uh, resiliency. So that's kind of the story behind that. All right. There are Can I, can I go? Thank you again for being here. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the role that robots will play in the next mission, the, I think, 2024 mission that you brought up, and maybe the relationship between those robots and the humans that may be accompanying them on the journey or, or working together for that mission? Uh, outstanding question. Um, uh, the way that it, the robotic conversation evolved was, for the longest time, there was a question about robots or humans, robots or humans. And I never felt like that was a question. So now we've evolved to the point where it's really a cooperative, collaborative effort. 
Um, there are some things that robots do very well, very reliably, very reproducibly. And there are some things that the human mind and experience um, does in a very innovative, um, uh, quickly adaptive fashion. Um, so although ultimately we plan on having shared operations where a lot of the um, work and maintenance and housekeeping or risky things can be done by robots, and that frees it up for human crews to be able to do so much more of the innovation and the science and the engineering. And it really is a great opportunity to make the scope of astronaut experience even broader because we're offloading a lot of the busy work that we're doing right now on station. But the more important role that the robots will play, especially in the upcoming missions, Cis Lunar and Mars, is they'll be precursor missions. Even before we go in 2024, we'll be sending robotic capabilities ahead of us who can actually start to set things up, um, 3D print, um, start to build or put together habitats. I always say if you're going to do an expedition um, off the planet, you have to figure out how to build your house when you can't go outside. That's a challenge for humans, but robots can do that. They can go in and out like that silly 10-year-old girl and be building the facility so that when we do go, then our fuel depots, our habitats, our um, equipment um, will already be up and running and ready to go along with some life support systems. It's the best welcome wagon you'll probably ever run into on this planet or off. Very fascinating <laughs> vision and possibilities, yes. Uh, some questions from the side, anyone? Yes. Yeah. Thank you again for your talk, it was amazing. Uh, my question is about the twins that you said one of them uh, have been changed after a year being in this space, which I think you are talking about astronaut Kelly. Yes. Uh, so. What kind of change is that? Does it have any effect on his uh, personal life or daily normal life? We're still sorting out the details on that. Um, so, um, uh, but what he has described is that when he came back, he was significantly deconditioned. And that's one of the reasons that we decided to um, pursue or continue pursuing a lunar mission first, because we do have to figure out how to keep the body robust and, and resilient in that way. It took him an extended period of time to rehabilitate, and, and it was very noticeable to him. Um, as important as mission success is the, the satisfaction or the ability of, of the crew member to reintegrate into their families and societies and their quality of life. And that can be very um, impeded or impaired when you're incredibly deconditioned, as you can imagine, from any kind of illness or injury. But this isn't that. This is just you know being in space for a long period of time, being in weightlessness. Um, the other thing that he said, which was very interesting, what was even more challenging um, were some of the psychologic um, uh, drifts and conditions that he experienced. And he said, even more than the physical impacts, we really do need to get our arms around the psychological um, um, experiences and transitions that happen. Um, not unlike we see with our deployments or people in our polar habitat, so we're doing more of those simulations. But it is something that needs to be anticipated and prepared for. So for that reason, that's another system that we're going to be really focusing on as well. Yes. Hi, uh, along the side of this identical twin, you mentioned about the identical twin, twin is no longer identical. So is that something reversible? That's one question. Second question is, does do human body adapt to the weightless conditions so the loss of uh, muscle or bone stop at one point or just continue to lose it? Excellent question. So the first question, are those genetic changes that have been detected, are they reversible? We don't know yet, um, but the way that genes work, um, your DNA and everything, they, they create these genes, and genes express certain proteins that give you 
the characteristics that you see. And so um, it'll be interesting to see at what levels those changes occurred. Were they in the um, nucleotide-based sequences of the DNA and the chromosomes, or were they more in the enzymes or the genes themselves in what they expressed? And gene expression responds to your environment. It responds to radiation. It responds to loads. Um, it responds to nutrition, things inside and outside of the body. So it'll be interesting to see um, based on the other twin, um, if any of that does start to change back in what it's expressing now that it's come into a different environment. Um, I think that's a fascinating question, is to see what is really nascent to um, weightlessness and, you know, the environment of space and radiation and what has that kind of resiliency or reversibility that can kind of reset or change once you change that environment? Um, fascinating question. Yes, sir. Thanks for the talk. And uh, recently, I'm just working on a prosthetics project by, by, by myself. And I just wonder, what was your most credible and reliable devices in that space? My most reliable what in space? Devices. Devices in space. Oh, prosthetic. and. Um, uh, before I answer that question, let me just hop back because it actually relates to your question. Um, in terms of do the changes that we see in muscle and bone, do they um, plateau off? And for short duration missions, anywhere from two weeks, three months, even six months, we do see that the muscle loss seems to plateau off at about 10% both mass and strength. Um, in bone in particular, you lose about 1% a month, but somewhere around 17%, then it seems like it plateaus off. Now, um, that means that there's probably some early acceleration or maybe you're pretty resilient at the beginning of losing bone, but it's kind of like a drain as you start to reach a critical threshold, you start to lose much more rapidly. But it seems when you hit that 17% that it plateaus off. Um, however, we don't know what will happen if suddenly you change the environment or you're in space for a longer period of time in transit to Mars. Will again those genes or those enzymes reactivate and start to say, we're in weightless, there's no resistance, we don't need this extra mass and bone, and that start to activate or reactivate the loss that's going on. So that's one of the things we hope to determine, um, again, with a 30-day lunar-based mission. Uh, and then in terms of in space, our best prosthetic um, or best tool. Um, let's see. We haven't had the need, need necessarily of um, human prosthetics at this point, although robots will be a whole different equation. Um, but we have used some of those space concepts to help with load balancing and strategies and shifting of center of gravity um, um, that we have to adjust for in space. Um, that's developed understanding and um, protocols and solutions that we can actually use to refine prosthetics right here on Earth. So with the robot earlier today, the NASA robot Valkyrie was amazing because a robot actually walks differently than a human does. You know, we turn to, tend to do heel to toe, and when we take the, when we're going to take a step, we don't just take the weight off, we transfer the weight to the foot that hasn't even planted yet. And that's kind of risky. But the way the robot works is the, f the leg, the foot will raise, but all the weight is still there until the robot is able to gauge that, OK, the balance is good, the terrain is good, this is going to be a good plant. Um, so that might be something that we incorporate in some of our mobility devices with uh, individuals um, who have mobility issues here. And also the way that the robot shifts the center of gravity um, is, um, is very fascinating because we can use that for load balancing, again, for transfer issues. The best tools that we found that we're finding um, uh, tend to be um, tools that we can 3D print. 
So wrenches and nuts and bolts and sockets, and in particular, um, medical equipment um, is very amenable to 3D printing and 3D design. And what we really love about 3D printers is that you can innovate on the spot. You can design on the spot. So when you're in weightlessness, the tool that you need may look very different than the way it's used in Earth. And you can redesign a wrench or a socket or something that can be very customized for not only what the interface is, not only the environment of, of something floating, you may want it angled, but also you're floating too. So you're coming at your work space or your work surface at a different orientation and you may need a tool with a different angle or curvature to help you um, engage that. Um, so all those things I think are really fascinating and you all are in a position to design, to design a way. I think you should all be astronauts so that you can make sure we have the tools that we need. <laughs> we'll consign or commission you all. I have a question kind of related to these uh, stresses. You mentioned that uh, gravity, of course, is a way of expressing some stresses. Have you or anyone have studied the effect of other stresses like electromagnetic uh, fields affecting our bodies in any fashion? And it will be very different probably on Mars and right. being closer to Sun. Well, we see a number of things. And, and first of all, in weightlessness, everything floats. Things outside of your body float and things inside your body float. So we're now doing earth normal ultrasounds to find out what our earth normal or earth-based positions of our organs are. Because when you go into space, if you develop an appendicitis or something happens and somebody has to go in and do, in most cases we're going to do laparoscopic, so through a scope, some kind of surgery and we need to access that organ, we need to have an idea of where it floated to. So after you get into space and we re-ultrasound just to know what your space normal look is like. So you kind of change. We're going in search, of, in search of aliens, but we change so much that maybe the alien we go in search of is ourself. So that's one thing is we, we need to know what that um, kind of map quest look is of our organs. Um, but the other thing that happens is because of the weightlessness of space, <clears throat> radiation, um, nutritional changes, the changes in our microbiome, meaning those organisms that live within us, those things change. So in so many ways, not just our DNA, not just our genes, but our organs, our intestinal flora, the microbes that are in our bodies, all these things change. So we really are a different person when we come back home. Um, but those things will also stress your immune system um, so that you've got this immunostrain going on. You're much more vulnerable to colds and viruses and latent viruses and at increased risk of certain um, kind of latent cancers. And because you're in a confined environment, if one person gets sick, then everybody is at greater risk to get sick. So our infection surveillance and control before, during, and after we come back is, is really important. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a fascinating, very dynamic look, which is why if I ever get boots on Mars, um, I don't want to visit, I want to colonize, because the only way you're really going to see the end of the movie is to be there and watch it evolve in front of you. So I'll be there, your welcoming committee. <laughs> I won't look the same, I won't behave the same, trust me. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, and I guess related to that, um, how do you see the, the colony looking? I mean, as an architecture and urban design student, it's fascinating the idea of these, uh, these robots kind of having designed and built the city before, or, or the colony before we even get there. But is, there a, is NASA looking at the actual design of that and how does the gravity uh, atmosphere affect the architecture and right. how, do you see, how do you see it? Great question. Um, yeah, so fascinating. There are actually simulations where they're building robotic cities, you know, um, smart cities and using robots to do the design to test it out. So we're watching those very closely. Um, Bigelow has inflatable habitats, um, kind of like, uh, you know, uh, for those of you who remember the, um, I, I know Lincoln Logs, I'm dating myself, but you know, where you used to plug them together, the different uh, 
uh, as a kid. Well, now they have an inflatable version that you can make different modules and habitats. And those are already being used in space by NASA as cargo. And come 2020, um, Bigelow is going to have an even larger one that we could actually use, you know, for human habitation. Um, we've already put in life support systems. We've been having astronauts go in them in order to test the environment, you know, with sensors and take different readings. Uh, but those are the kind of habitats we're looking at right now, inflatable habitats. Um, but ultimately, for colonization and as we build cities and all, I think the fascinating view would be some kind of geodesic design, something that's frictionless, weightless, um, and the question is, is it going to be above or below ground? Because radiation is a problem. And although water is one of the best combatants against or protectants against radiation, a lot of weight, a lot of uplift, you want to make orbit. So we really have to find the water where we're going. Um, but one of the ways to um, protect uh, from radiation may be to have you know, caves or more like um, to go underground and have that as being your living city. So different ways we can do it. Also, the regolith of the moon, regolith is uh, moon dust, moon dirt, basically. Um, and that has some radiation protective qualities as well. We can do titanium, polycarbonates, um, aluminum, I'm just throwing all that out there to you design engineers, just so you know that those are just the options we know. And every day we're coming up with smart materials and textiles that are lightweight and, you know, um, malleable. So who knows? Anything's possible. <laughs> Hi. Um, referencing your comment that the, we might be the alien, and thinking about how artists and science fiction writers have often been the ones to float ideas that made it comfortable for us to think about some of these things um, and then blend them in with what science is actually doing or thinking. When we look at this twin with a changed genetic DNA, what have we seen that might be an upside to the change in the human body? I mean, if the human body is going to change, and we're trying to figure out how to stabilize it or pause it or restart it, what if it went on? Could there be changes that could be positive to enable us to go then and do what we need to do? Absolutely. The whole reason that the body changes is that it's trying to adapt to its environment and build up its strength and resiliency. So the body isn't really working against us. It's not so much our alien, it's our friend. It's saying that, I'm not going to give you a whole lot more workload with all this muscle and bone. I'm going to loosen it, lighten it up, because it doesn't know you have an intention of returning back to gravity or going to alter gravity environments or coming back home. Um, and that's the efficient way. The body is always working towards efficiency. So if you have a colonizer or somebody who's going to continue to travel interstellarly, then they, over time, will evolve and look different um, and be very efficient for their environment. Um, and so it'll be interesting to see what happens when we start having families um, because those things happen at a very early stage. So, um, you know, there are changes that may occur in the womb that will um, um, create a different look, performance, and capability. Um, we interpret everything here on Earth through the lens of gravity. But I got to tell you, if you do the math, the best astronauts are not your um, gold medal Olympic uh, runners, swimmers, and other athletes. Um, it's uh, it's going to be somebody who may have spent the majority of their life or extended period of time in a wheelchair, and their body has changed and adapt, adapted. And they have tremendous, not only upper body strength, but their brain has neurocognitively upper body strategy. It knows how to think with the upper body. In space, your legs are a liability. They're just a plasma volume sump. <laughs> um, there's no weight in space, but if there was, the closest thing, we would look like the legs. And, but we think in terms of our legs, our mobility, our transfer, our prosthetics, how we move about. I love 3D printers because 
um, somebody gets a sprained finger or an ankle, now we have something that can turn that around potentially in a matter of minutes, so it may be a moot point. But uh, we can customize a splint or a brace or something like that on the top, uh, on the spot. It's going to save a lot of space and up mass as we go. But um, I think the body is going to sort of naturally find its own way to build its strength and its resiliency. So if somebody has been in space for an extended period of time, it'll be interesting to see if their life support requirements are the same. Maybe they'll need less oxygen, less water. Maybe they'll be more tolerant being outside. And, and, and somebody who has lived their life in a wheelchair, they may know how to have a space brain and think about how to efficiently move and engage and problem solve much more effectively and faster than us who wait till our legs get us to where we need to be and then they position us and we've got a tool that's based on um, a leg brain that was vetted in earth. So it's a whole different world. Um, yeah, I, I, would, I would say our instructors here on earth would probably be um, those folks who don't necessarily get the credit in the intent in the attention for the subject matter experts that they are living in an upper body world or a sensory dampened world in space vacuum. So sound is going to be dampened. It's going to be dark and dim. So somebody whose vision isn't so great but has adapted to that here on Earth, all of these folks will be our subject matter experts when we go to space. Another question? Well, if there is none, there is one. Okay, over there. Hi, thank you so much for coming. This is so cool. Hey, hi, <laughs> I, me too. I think the same. Hey, that's two. Two, do we have three? Four, 12, okay. <laughs> Um, I was wondering, like, what are the um, different things you have to do for, like, sleep? Because I know that, like, sleep cycles are, like, really weird when you're, like, up in space. And I know that, like, space travel is very different, but, like, Mars has, like, a different, like, time of, like, day and night cycle. So, like, what are, like, different ways that, like, I don't know, they have to deal with, like, alertness or, like, performance when, like, the light is different. Things. Right. It, that's That's probably one of the biggest problems that... Um, you know, adds to the behavioral drift from neurocognitive stressors. It's going to be sleep and sensory deprivation. Um, and the sleep is partly because, remember the slide where you take your seatbelt off and you're floating and the ah, that sort of, yeah, and the first word out of your mouth is whoa? Well, that stays, and that stays 24-7. It's just like your brain is just like, wow, this is awesome. This is cool, right? And so it's hard to sleep. So we know that our sleep cycle is very much truncated, meaning it, it's narrowed, it's, um, it's telescoped, it's reduced. And we know on average a good night's sleep at best is probably only six hours. Well, we don't know. Well, we do know. Um, but a large part of that is just the excitement. I mean, you're in space. Who wants to sleep? You don't want to miss anything. Uh, but also there's something in the – there's a circadian misalignment misalignment with light dart cycles and the neurohormones that the pituitary and um, hypothalamus and other regulatory organs um, um, are affected by, and your melatonin as well. Um, we don't have a handle on all of that. We don't fully understand it, but that doesn't mean that um, we can't try different things that can um, be a potential solution or at least improve. So we try to do different things with the lighting. Um, we have certain light values that we use and even um, autom uh, we're looking at automated dimmer switches that can dim the station at different times to sort of give you that sense of night day. The problem is you, most cases you have two shifts and so if you've got shifts that are you know 180 to each other then it's hard to um, control what that uh, day-night cycle is going to look like. Uh, so it may be something that you can only do in the sleep cabin because if you dim the switch at a time when the night shift is needing to work and see things, that can be a safety and performance issue as well. 
So we're kind of looking at those different sorts of things. And the lidian is important, too, for the plants that we're growing as well, because all life requires this kind of, you know, light, dark, day, night cycle. And your whole um, metabolic system, your biorhythm, is tied to that as well. Um, and if you don't have that, it's interesting in space, you know, there's not a lot of that, so it's not surprising life isn't rampant. But certainly over time, if you lose that ability, if, you're, if you develop that circadian misalignment and you lose that cycling ability, that can be very stressful. We see cortisol levels go up, and there's something called adrenal fatigue or adrenal failure, where you're just kind of in overdrive and the histamine is just churning away, and it starts to take um, its toll and have effects on your, your health and, and wellness let alone your performance and your behavioral um, coherence. Great question. Um, exercise, nutrition, eating right, magnesium, all those things are really important to help with sleep as well. Now, it's not just, it's not so much how long you sleep, although it's important, but it's also the quality of sleep. So you've got to get through all the stages of sleep so that you can get into your deep sleep, which is not REM, it's after, it's after REM. It's that kind of deep restorative sleep. And so if you don't get down that far, um, you know, then you really are not kind of refreshing your glymphatics, glial and lymphatic system to detox your body. So. Um, hello. You've shared a, 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 a very exciting timeline for a human mission to Mars. And it seems that you have a pretty clear idea of what are the milestones that we have to meet and what are the things that we need to know and the things that we need to have in order to meet that deadline. What do you think are the main things that might go wrong that could force us to delay that, uh, that uh, timeline for a long time? Right. What could delay? Um, uh, now, do you mean robotics or humans? I mean, it seems like it's pretty soon. I yeah. mean, in 2030, we're going to Mars. Yeah, it's coming very uh, fast. Is it exactly. Uh, knowledge development? Is it, uh, is it funding? Is it, uh, I mean, what, what do you see that could force us to take much longer than we technically could take to get to, to, get to Mars? Yes. In other words, I'm saying yes to all the things that you need. Technology, funding, uh, but you know you can have all the money in the world, but if you don't have the solutions or the uh, uh, validated designs, um, then you're still sort of um, in the middle of the ocean without any oars. Um, on the other hand, you can have amazing turbo oars, but not have the funding to be able to launch you um, um, on those expeditions. So it's a combination of things. But, um, so it is funding. It is, um, you know, the engineering, the tools, the robotics, the capability, the human system. Um, we do have to figure out how to shield and protect uh, humans, um, the vehicle, um, and the human body itself. Um, and if we don't, we do have to come up with ways of coming up with um, how do we um, kind of uh, harvest our stem cells in order to re-implant our immune system if we just want to expose ourselves? Because one big radiation hit is actually better than having shielding that might dissipate it into 50 smaller ones that last longer. So we have to think about all these things. But I think the biggest limiter of all is our ability to think outside the box. Here's your shirt. Exactly. <laughs> is the ability to think outside the box, is the ability to um, pursue that which appears impossible, is the ability to inspire and enable and empower our next generation, is our ability to be inclusive and diverse so that we can have lots of different solutions is our ability to be collaborative and to team together, um, is our ability to dream and to believe that those dreams have the power to come true if we work together as a team, in teams. With that, I want to thank you for two things. One is, of course, the life story that you inspire us, 
and also for these visions for the future that should also be very inspiring. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.